would you like to give your comment? No, she doesn't want to give her comment. <laughs> She's been working with uh, music therapy. Okay, uh, maybe this is the last question. I will read because of the uh, time element. Okay, okay I'm, I'm 23 years old, diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I noticed that my memory and mental function have declined since I was 16. I have been, I have only been taking medications for the past two years with minimal doses. Does bipolar disorder cause significant memory loss and mental decline? How can we manage? Please comment. Um, typically, it's an interesting observation. Typically, while the disorder is active, while you're either high or depressed, you do have an impairment in cognitive function. You don't think as clearly, you don't concentrate as well, and there may be some memory deficit. However, as the symptoms get better, that should improve. So I'm a little troubled that she feels that she's having a sort of progressive loss of memory and cognitive function, even though I'm presuming the symptoms are getting better. <clears throat> and I would, I would get some neuropsychological or neurological evaluation to, to figure out why that's happening. Thank you. Okay, maybe okay. last uh, question. How do I get my young adult daughter to get back to her doctor? <laughs> she stopped taking medications and lives by herself. This is where a worried oh. uh, mother. Yeah. It's a very hard thing. I, I assume she's a young adult. She's not a child. Um, young adult. So, you know, it's, it's very hard because you can't physically, you know, force them to do it. Um, again, I would say just sort of quiet, loving persistence. You know, the problem often is... Um, the more right you are and the more the dialogue becomes one of right and wrong, the more the child is going to resist it, right? Because, they, you know, basically the message they get is, you think I'm crazy and I can't do anything for myself. And, and, and you may be right about that, but it's humiliating to kind of accept that idea. So I would just be sort of quietly persistent. I think one of the other things that happens in situations like this is you tend to focus all of your contact around the problem area. So you're not taking your meds. So it's better if you, when you have contact, focus your contact mostly around other things. Like it's really nice that you got some new furniture for your apartment or that you got out and did X, Y, and Z. So that it isn't all about criticism. It's also about positive reinforcement for things that she's doing that help. And then, you know, you could also say, you know, humor me. I would feel better if you were taking your medication. So it's not that it's right or wrong, but it would help me to know that you're getting the treatment you deserve. See if that'll work. And the QLP, quiet, loving, persistent. There you go. Okay. QLP. <laughs> so I think, uh, what did you want to say about the questions? Wow. Okay, there's a good there's a service here. If you have other questions, Dr. Soler says write them down, give them to him, and then they'll find a way to answer it. Genie, yeah, Genie, That's Genie nice. Okay. And, uh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for your question. Uh, Dr. Spiegel, in our midst, our five mothers, who lost their children in depression, one just three weeks ago. And there is something I'd like to ask you, this question, when you get back to Stanford. And, uh, and I'd like to ask this question, it's very important. This mother has been talking to me for five minutes. Her child, her 20-year-old son, who took his life three weeks ago from Ateneo, the psychologists, in Ateneo never told her that the child was bipolar. Now all the mothers who have lost their children in suicide, either by overdose or by other methods, we feel that some doctors, psychiatrists, never inform us as parents how we can support and help our children. So we would like to ask, because there is this thing, over 18, the psychiatrist told me, I owe you nothing. And he pushed my child to find a job at the midst of her depression. So therefore, listening to this mother, 
my heart goes out to her because there are very good doctors like you who are compassionate, who do integrative method of finding a way. But there are doctors, and I would like to say this openly, who really feel that they are the gods and they are empowered to control the lives of the depressed without help from anybody close to them. So I would like to appeal to all the mothers who lost their children, let's go to the universities and let's give talks and let's talk to psychiatrists through Hani Karangdang. Let's find a way that the family can be engaged in a support system for the healing of bipolar and by other illnesses that have depression. Without the family support. Now, on the other hand, Dr. Spiegel, I know and I've met three adults who were previously abused by the father. Now, that kind of relationship, we cannot ask the family help, but perhaps the closest friend or a teacher or a professor. Am I right, doctor? We do need help. I believe in what you said, the group support. So I would like to engage, uh, I would like to tell Gina de Venetia to please give me those mothers and then we will try to work with Dr. Hani Karangdang to appeal to the universities and to all the doctors that there's no such thing. Once your child is 18, it's none of your business what she or he tells me. As a parent, we are not interested to know the details. We just want to know what can we do to help. Am I correct, Sydney? The psychiatrist that my daughter had did not even want to talk to my husband. And he pushed her. Unfortunately, he took his life a year after. I told him, every time you wake up and you give my daughter any stronger medication that has changed her personality completely, she accused my husband and me of having uh, punished her to the point that perhaps we wanted her dead. Now, what, that was the effect of medication. And I know that because I had a conversation with her. I had through a London medium. And she said, don't sue the doctor. He took his life a year after. I'm sorry, it's the truth. Maybe Dr. Soler doesn't want me to say this, but you all should know the truth. Thank you. No, uh, I, do, I don't mind Jeannie saying anything she wants to say, uh, but I will tell you that that psychiatrist, his wife recently divorced him over religious differences. He thought he was God and she did not agree. <laughs> the, the most wasted days of our lives are those days when we don't laugh. But we've had enough laughter for today, so I will deliver the closing remarks. I delight in this. Since my wife died and I had the chance to say the last word, I always say it. <laughs> Depression is serious. It's a very, very serious disease. I will talk of it in the context of the Philippines. 3% of Filipinos are clinically diagnosed by doctors as being depressed. That's not even the tip of the iceberg. Because there are studies that indicate that of 90 depressives, only 30 will go to, see, to seek help. The other 30 will be so, they will know they're, they're depressed, they will suffer the symptoms, but they will be so ashamed of it or so scared of the stigma that they will keep it to themselves and they will suffer in shame and pain. The other 30% sadly will suffer the symptoms but don't even know what they have. This is why we organize seminars like this. Because we believe that if 
people only knew what depression is. Everything they can know about it, it is already a great first step in managing their depression. In fact, when I developed this program for Dr. Spiegel, I came up with two audiences, the lay community, you, and the doctors. Why so? With you, we can directly tell you what it is, and you can spread the word. And the concept here, the concept here is do not let the content of this seminar remain in this auditorium. Go spread the word. Tell people. We did the same thing with now about 500 doctors, and we expect to tell them again. Why? Because doctors tend to be too specialized. And when somebody comes with an earache, they don't bother to check whether he might be depressed. How bad is depression in the Philippines? I walked into this room and I've counted 47 of you are depressed. <laughs> now, remember, your chances are one of five that you will, come de de that you will become depressed. Moreover, it is highly improbable that you do not have a member of your family who is depressed. And that is not necessarily your mother-in-law. <laughs> there is somebody in your family who is depressed. It creates a problem. The Natasha Goldborn Foundation is a non-profit organization. All we want to do is tell people about depression through distinguished, eminent, celebrated people like Dr. David Spiegel through the help of the Venerable Dr. Hani Karandang. I don't mean Venerable, Hani, I don't mean Venerable in the same sense as Mother Teresa. Huh? <laughs> uh, and we want to help demystify demystify depression. David put it very well in Cebu, when he said in Cebuano, you do not have to be buang to be depressed. Uh, let me see what else. We all learned a couple of things from, we all learned a couple of things from the lecture today. I learned a couple of things. One of the things that really impressed me was when Dr. Spiegel said that it is important for us to be able to face the fear of dying and death itself squarely, directly. Uh, as a result of that, thinking about it, I made up my mind how exactly I want to die. I want to die the way my grandfather, I made up my mind how exactly I want to die. I want to die the way my grandfather died. Sleeping, dreaming, solidly asleep, unlike those people screaming and holding at the back of the bus he was driving. <laughs> now, he also said, in that aspect, in the same context, do not be afraid of death. In this, when Mac, Max Oliven died, I delivered a eulogy and I remembered one particular, particular Latin poem. David likes to quote all these people. I like to make my own quote. It's from Catullus. And it says, Bacheb, I'll say it in English. Kiss me, kiss me, kiss me. Oh, let me explain. It's about a Roman senator who's having an affair with the wife of a, an older senator, and they're in bed, and he's choosing her. And he says, kiss me, kiss me, kiss me a thousand times, and a thousand times more, and a thousand times more. And don't pay attention to what those old men say, because they don't make sense, not to all the gossip.